Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on this week's video. In this week's video, we're in part two of section one of our new series entitled, What's the Point? What's the Point? And in this series, we're talking about uh, important principles and procedures uh, of the QME examination in general. And in this section, we're focusing first on the physical examination, or I should say your physical examination. And in, in part one of this series, uh, we talked about reflex testing and the importance uh, of reflex testing as a true objective finding in your physical examination. So if you did not have a chance to view uh, that video, that was a fascinating discussion. Uh, we went over the anatomy of the reflex arc and uh, shared with you some principles about how to uh, perform this testing to arrive at true objective findings. In today's session, I want to talk to you about uh, another part of your physical examination, and it has to do with sensory testing. And sensory testing is described in the AMA guides, uh, at least in chapters 13, 15, 16, and 17. And I'm going to give you some references from chapter 15, but we'll use those references from chapter 15 to analogize to other chapters and just basically to illustrate the point of the necessity uh, of doing sensory testing as, as part of most of your physical examination of the neuromusculoskeletal system. If I phrase that another way, perhaps a little more clearly, <laughs> I should say that the sensory testing is an important part of almost every physical examination of the neuromusculoskeletal system. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. And I'll give you some references from the AMA guides to illustrate that principle. Now, a couple principles uh, and concepts that I want to share with you about uh, sensory testing. I've spoken to many, many, many doctors over the past several years, and it seems that there's about as many different ways to do sensory testing as there are doctors that are doing the sensory testing. And from my discussions with doctors uh, throughout the weeks, months, and years, it seems to me that most doctors perform sensory testing in a way that makes the sensory testing invalid. It basically makes the sensory testing completely subjective. Now, sensory testing is largely subjective, and I'm gonna share with you some ways to make sensory testing more objective but it is inherently largely subjective. In other words, there's under the control of the examinee. And some doctors uh, augment and potentiate the subjectivity of the testing by leading the examinee into a positive finding response. In other words, leading the examinee to respond as if there was a positive finding for sensory loss present when in actuality sensory function is preserved and intact. So I want to share with you today some principles about how to perform your sensory testing. I want to review with you uh, some of the anatomy of what it is that we're actually testing when we bring out our pinwheel, when we bring out our tuning fork, when we bring out our SEMS Weinstein monofilament. So I'm sure you'll find that to be uh, a fascinating review of neuroanatomy. And then uh, to conclude today's program, I want to share with you a videotape on a live examinee. We just produced it uh, yesterday. And in this videotaping, uh, we go over three basic scenarios that I want to share with you. One is the sensory testing on a completely normal and a completely sincere examinee. <laughs> I'm sure you'll find that to be a novel experience. <laughs> since we don't often encounter those. And then number two, uh, I wanna share with you the sensory testing on an examinee who gives uh, inconsistent and confounding findings. And I'm sure you're gonna be able to relate to this because many examinees give us findings uh, that are confounding and inconsistent. In other words, their findings lead us to believe that mm, perhaps there is a problem, mm, in other areas uh, it's not a problem, and Findings are what we could just simply say are mixed, mixed. And I refer to those as confounding findings. And then finally, uh, in our third videotaping, we portray an examinee 
who has no intention of providing sincere findings for us. Rather, the examinee has every intention of providing uh, inaccurate and insincere findings. In other words, we're going to portray how a malingerer responds to sensory testing and what you can do when you encounter such an examinee so that you can arrive at opinions and conclusions that are truthful, that are accurate, and that are a uh, true representation of the examinee's condition on the date of your evaluation. So I'm sure you're going to find those series of videotapings to be fascinating and invaluable. And I'm sure you'll be able to relate to them as well from your own experience. So to begin today, before we get into some uh, anatomy review, just want to give you some references uh, from the AMA guides. And as I said, I'm going to be pulling these references out of chapter 15 in order to illustrate uh, principles of sensory testing that apply to examination of other areas of the spine uh, of the body as well. But we're using chapter 15, the spine chapter, simply as our reference. Okay. So I've made some photocopies uh, of pages from chapter 15 so that I can quickly retrieve the references I want to share with you because as you can see my book is all <laughs> highlighted up and so I don't want to have to search through multiple highlights to get to our references today so I have those pages copied for us here okay so this is in chapter 15 page 374 just a couple references here to sensory testing uh, uh, under the examination description here on page 374, which is right here. It says, says, since a targeted neurologic assessment is needed for individuals with back or neck problems, the physician must have a good grasp of basic neurologic examination techniques and principles. And uh, it describes Assessing, assessing for sensory deficits, okay? So we're going to review some of the basic anatomy involved so that we're all up to speed on what it is that we're actually testing when we do our uh, sensory testing procedures. On page uh, 375 in table 15-1, the AMA guides uh, describe for us some skeletal examination or I should say the basic examination skeleton uh, that we can refer to for our spinal exam and for the lumbar spine they describe uh, sensory testing uh, both sitting and supine for the cervical spine uh, also they describe sensory testing so we know that sensory testing forms one of the bases one of the bases for our neurologic assessment of the spinal nerve roots okay now here the AMA guides caution us and I want you to uh, accept this reference uh, from the AMA guides as supportive uh, of our philosophy today and I know you've heard me say this over and over again but it's good to have an actual reference from the AMA guides to back up what may seem to be my overriding philosophy which actually my overriding philosophy is derived from principles of the AMA guides. It says here on page 375, this is second column, second paragraph highlighted right here. It says, many physical findings are subjective, meaning that they're potentially under the influence of the individual. It is important to appreciate this and to not confuse such observations with truly objective findings. <laughs> okay? Now, think about your sensory testing, and I want you to think about your sensory examination procedures and how you go about the procedure with your examinee. Is that procedure on the spectrum from completely subjective to completely objective? Where does your procedure lie on that spectrum? On this spectrum, with regards to our sensory testing, we're never going to be able to completely eliminate the subjective portion of the examinee's response, but there are things that we can do to move our procedures more towards the objective end of the spectrum. But I want you to think about 
your own evaluation, the, your own procedure as to how you do this. You know, it's amazing. I talk to some doctors and I ask them, tell me how you do the sensory testing. And the doctor will tell me, well, uh, I roll up the examinee's sleeves, and that's good. That's fine. We want to expose the skin. I say, yeah. And the doctors tell me, well, I then uh, explain to the examinee that I'm going to be touching them with this instrument, whether it be a pinwheel or a monofilament. And you get a head nod from the examinee that they understand that. And then the doctor will tell the examinee, now, I want you to tell me, I want you to tell me if you feel it more or less on one side or the other. Now, imagine an examinee coming in reporting symptoms consistent with radiculopathy, okay? And they describe numbness in one of their upper extremities. The doctor then comes along and says, I want you to tell me if you feel this more or less in one arm or the other. And I say to the doctor, yeah, okay, and then what do you do? And the doctor says, well, then I move my instrument, such as a pinwheel or a monofilament, over the area in question, and I ask them, do you feel it more or do you feel it less than on the other side? And I ask them, okay, and how does the examinee respond? And they'll tell me invariably that the examinee responds that they feel it less, <laughs> they feel it less on the side of involvement. This is a completely subjective procedure. And basically, this finding has no validity at all. I'm going to share with you some procedures that you can implement right away that will instantly move your procedure more toward the objective end of the spectrum and will provide you uh, with more reliable findings in those rare cases, rare cases, where the examinee actually does have decreased sensation or does have what we refer to as sensory deficits. Okay? So uh, we'll go over those uh, procedures in just a couple minutes. For now, uh, let's have a basic neuroanatomy review and review the structures involved with our sensory testing. So I look forward to being back, back, right back here with you in just a minute as we get out the uh, whiteboard and review uh, today principles of the sensory exam. some of the basic anatomy involved with our sensory testing. So here we are, we're talking about uh, sensory testing of uh, spinal nerve roots or upper extremity or lower extremity peripheral nerves. Okay. So let's begin here at the spinal cord. This is a cross section of the spinal cord and let's here talk about a section of the cervical spinal cord for testing the upper extremities. So let's imagine that this is uh, perhaps the C6 level of the spinal cord. This is ventral, this is dorsal. So here is the dorsal root, here is the ventral root. Those come together and they form the spinal nerve root. Okay, So there's the spinal nerve root. Spinal nerve root. We're going to call this the C6 spinal nerve root. Okay? Now, with regards to our sensory testing, we're testing the function of uh, basically the dorsal root. Okay? Now, in the dorsal root, the nerve cell bodies of the neurons are located here in the dorsal root ganglion, just outside the spinal cord and there's many different types of these sensory neurons okay 
Some of them are myelinated, some of them are unmyelinated, and they all connect to different types of sensory receptors. There's several different types of sensory receptors, and we'll talk about a couple of those as relates to our sensory testing. Now, these sensory neurons are referred to as pseudo-unipolar neurons. So pseudo-unipolar neurons have a, have a single axon that comes off of the nerve cell body. So there's a single axon. And then the axon then branches. And it creates a central process. And then it creates a peripheral process that enters the spinal nerve root. Central process ent enters the spinal cord, makes connections here with second order neurons that ascend. Uh, after they ascend, they make connections with third order neurons in the thalamus and ascend to cortical centers where we perceive sensation. So we have a central process and a peripheral process. And this is a recurring theme. These are all pseudo unipolar neurons. Now, these pseudo-unipolar neurons travel out into the spinal nerve root, and this is the C6 spinal nerve root. So in this case, imagine this sensory neuron traveling all the way to the tip of the index finger. It gets there, it gets to the tip of the index finger by traveling in the median nerve. So when we test sensation at the tip of the finger, we're testing the function of the median nerve, primarily fibers from C6, primarily fibers from C6. We know the median nerve is composed of fibers of other spinal levels, but it's the C6 fibers that primarily go to the tip of the index finger anyway, okay? Now, once we get out here at the tip of the index finger, there are several different types of sensory receptors located in the tip of the index finger. For example, we have Merkel's discs. Merkel's <laughs> discs. We have Meisner's corpuscles. We have Ruffini endings. We have Pacinian corpuscles. Pacinian. We have free nerve endings. Not on the tip of the finger, but perhaps on the other side of the finger, we would have hair follicle receptors. Hair follicle receptors. And so there's all these different types of sensory nerve endings. Well, for our purposes, for our sensory testing, we're primarily going to be testing the Merkel's discs, the Meisner's corpuscles. Sometimes for other parts of the body, we test our sensation by stimulating hair follicles to see if we can get a response. Sometimes we test uh, the Ruffini and Pacinian corpuscles by applying deeper pressure that deforms the tissue all the way down into the subcutaneous layers. Sometimes we test the free nerve endings, especially when we use the tip of our pinwheel. But with regards to Sems Weinstein monofilaments, we're primarily testing the Merkel's discs and the Meisner's corpuscles. Now, the Merkel's discs and the Meisner's corpuscles are the sensory receptors that inform us about light touch. So, for example, when an ant crawls across your finger, you realize that because you're getting a action potential being produced in this sensory neuron and that action potential it was initiated here through the deformation, the mechanical deformation of either a Meisner's corpuscle or a Merkel's disc, both of which are located right within the dermis at either the epidermal dermal junction or perhaps slightly even deeper in the dermis in the case of the Meisner's corpuscle. Okay? So all of these, all of these are traveling in the median nerve <laughs> and all the way up into the C6 spinal nerve root and they all have their 
cell bodies here. Some of these are myelinated, some of them are unmyelinated, but they travel in a bundle. A bundle either of the nerve root or a bundle later on as the median nerve. So a lesion or an injury here, perhaps from a disc bulge or a disc herniation, <coughs> can interfere with the transmission of those action potentials at the nerve uh, and, and the reception of those uh, action potentials at the nerve cell body. Similarly, a lesion out here in the periphery of the median nerve can block the transmission of those action potentials and can cause subjective sensations of numbness, tingling, burning, all of the different types of paresthesia. So when we do our sensory testing, we simply touch around with our Semmes-Weinstein monofilaments to cause a mechanical deformation of these sensory nerve endings. Some of these are simply free naked nerve endings. Some of those are nerve endings with a capsule around them, a multi-layered capsule that when it gets deformed, when it gets deformed, let me draw that in with a different color, when it gets deformed, through the pressure of our Semmes-Weinstein monofilament causes a receptor potential and an action potential to be propagated towards the central nervous system where it makes a synapse with second order neurons, makes a synapse with third order neurons, and the examinee should report to you <laughs> that they felt the sensation, that they felt the sensation, okay? So that's uh, the basic anatomy involved, and those are some of the neuroanatomic structures. I think it's important that we realize what it is that we're testing. Now, sometimes if you test your examinee and you don't get a response to light touch testing, in other words, they don't respond to the stimulus, what you can do is you can then use a larger, a larger stimulus a larger monofilament to create a greater deformation or to stimulate structures deeper into the subcutaneous layers, into the fascia and into the deeper connective tissue. <clears throat> or uh, you can attempt to stimulate uh, a hair follicle receptor by taking your Semmes-Weinstein monofilament and simply dragging it up and moving the position of hair follicles to see if you can get a response that way. Finally, in addition to these specialized sensory receptors, we also have sensory receptors in the ligaments, in the muscles, and in the joints, in the capsules around the joints. And we refer to those generally as the proprioceptors. So if you fail to get a response, through your cutaneous receptors, you may then attempt to see if the examinee has intact, intact proprioception by testing some joint and deeper connective tissue structures. And I'll give you an example as to how we do that. Remember, even the proprioceptors from the joints here, and I've drawn here the interphalangeal joints, all of those travel in the same bundles and they have the same basic anatomy. We're just testing different types of sensory receptors. Now most examinees will provide uh, accurate responses 99.99 percent of the time because most examinees even when they have some numbness can still feel and have intact function of some of these sensory receptors. And you can relate to this one. Remember the last time that you had uh, a dental procedure and the dentist used Novocaine on you and the skin surface uh, of your mouth was otherwise completely numb. Well, <laughs> what happens when you press on some of the perioral structures? You can feel it. You say, you say to yourself, I feel that. But yet, to, to stroking of the skin, the skin is completely numb. Well, the reason is the function of these other deeper sensory receptors 
may be preserved even though the superficial sensory cutaneous receptors uh, are anesthetized. And I have personal experience uh, with this myself. Uh, about 10 years ago, I had a, an accident on a motocross bike and the handlebar came and hit me <coughs> in my right thigh on the side of the thigh and in the back of the thigh. And it caused damage to both the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve and the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, such that if I run my hand along the skin behind my knee right here, it's completely numb. It's completely numb. So that when I wash or if I shave that area, uh, it's completely numb. And so I'm doing this right now, running my hand uh, across the popliteal fossa and the skin layer uh, it's completely numb. But that's injury to the cutaneous nerves. If I press deeper and deform some of the deeper receptors like the Pacinian corpuscles, the Ruffini endings, uh, if I press in deeper and deform those, I can feel it. Sensation is preserved and intact in most of your examinees. In fact, I'm saying 99.99% .99 of your examinees should be able to provide you with accurate localization uh, of your test stimulus because they're going to have intact function uh, of the sensory receptors and intact function of the entire loop both in the peripheral nervous system and then also ascending in the central nervous system. So let's take a, a break now and come back with a demonstration as to how these test procedures would appear uh, on a live examinee. Okay, so I look forward to being right back with you uh, in just a couple moments. some tests now to examine your nerves. I have a little instrument here. Can you see that? Yes. It's like a little hair? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm going to touch around on your arms and instrument feels about like this. Tickles. Can you feel that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to touch around on your arms and with your eyes closed, tell me where on the arm you feel it and on which arm you feel it. Mm -hmm. On which arm mm -hmm. and where on the arm you feel it? So like my left wrist. Correct. Okay? Okay. Okay, so we'll roll this up. Okay, so eyes closed please. Uh-huh. Okay. So I'm touching around. Tell me on which arm you feel it and where on the arm you feel it. All right. My right shoulder. inside of my left elbow, my left shoulder, inside of my right elbow, my right index finger, my left pinky, my right ring finger, my right pinky, my left ring middle finger, my left thumb. Very good, very good. And this is a normal sensory examination. She was able to quickly and accurately localize the test stimulus. This indicates preserved and intact function of spinal nerve roots and upper extremity peripheral nerve.
so eyes closed please. Okay. Touching around, tell me on which arm you feel it and where on the arm you feel it, okay? Uh-huh. My right shoulder. The back of my left hand. My right index finger. Good. My right pinky. my left index finger. My left middle finger. My inside of my right elbow. Good. inside of my left elbow. Good. One more. Anything? something on my left shoulder. Okay, very good. Eyes open. Uh -huh. And this indicates preserved and intact function of spinal nerve roots and upper extremity peripheral nerves. She was able to accurately localize the test stimulus, five areas on both upper extremities. Okay, so eyes closed, please. Okay. Okay, so just touching around. Tell me where on the arm you feel it and on which arm you feel it, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you doing it? Yep, tell me where you feel it and on which arm you feel it. Left thumb. You feeling it? Feeling anything? No, I feel that on my on my right, like my middle of my arm, like the bicep. On my back of my right hand. So my middle finger of my left hand. Nothing? No. Do you feel that? 
Gotcha. Okay, let's try a different test. Okay. Okay. Seems like you're not able to feel that. You having numbness in your arms? Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. That doesn't seem to work very well. Okay. Okay, so let's try a different test. Okay. Same thing with your eyes closed. Uh -huh. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take your fingers, and I'm going to take one finger and either position it up. Mm -hmm. That's up. Mm -hmm. That would be down. Okay. Now you'll have your eyes closed, so you won't be able to see it. Mm -hmm. But I'll position it either up mm -hmm. or down. Mm -hmm. You tell me if it's either up or down. Okay. Okay, see how that feels? That's up. That's down. Got it? I don't because it's numb, but I understand. Okay. Let's see if you can do it with your eyes closed. Okay. Okay, so eyes closed. Okay. So I'm going to start here with your pinky finger. I have your pinky finger. Okay. Tell me if it's either up or down. Down. Up. Up. Okay. Next finger. Down. Ring finger down. Ring finger up. Okay, next one. It's totally numb, huh? Index finger up. Index finger down. Index finger up. Okay, next one. Thumb up. Thumb down. Thumb up. Middle finger down. Middle finger down. Middle finger down. Got it. Okay. Eyes open.